come before the Lord in song to worship. Two, three. next song is kind of a reminder that we're connected with Christians all over the world. And it's a good time to, to keep in prayer the Christians who are undergoing persecution, violence. So...
To hold on to, I'm holding on to you. Psalm 25, show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good.
Amen. <laughs> Father God, we are so grateful to be in your presence today. And as Pastor Eddie comes forward to bring the message, we just ask that you open our hearts and minds and make it all a blessing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Come on, let's give him a shout because he's worthy. <laughs> well, listen, we have a reason to shout. We have a reason to celebrate. I think we have a reason to celebrate every day. But today we're going to do some shouting because uh, there isn't anything that I think gives more joy is when we see God birth something new. Amen? Amen. Whether that's in a, someone's life whether that's a situation that maybe you thought was dead and God brought it back to life. Maybe God is just producing something new, and it is always an opportunity to celebrate. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, listen, do me a favor. Let's take a moment. I want you to turn around, greet someone, say hello, and celebrate a life next to you. Put it on. Woo! All right. You guys are such a great, friendly group of people. It's amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, listen, I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for coming out. Tremendous blessing. Let me just uh, welcome everyone, and uh, especially our first time guests are with us, and our returning guests, and we want all our first-time guests to know how New Hope is a place for imperfect people to belong, to grow, to serve, and to find healing and hope. And we endeavor to do that by loving Jesus, loving people, and serving our city and the world. And uh, there isn't anything that gives us greater joy than God using us to birth something new to come alongside and help people. Amen? Amen. And uh, I tell you, you guys do a fantastic job of loving people and loving our city. And uh, uh, we're going to see God do some amazingly more things. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that a little bit later. And, uh, but before we kind of go any further, I want, where are my kids? Where are my teens? Come on up. Woohoo! What's up, buddy? Doing a little marriage counseling up here with these two little guys. Mom and dad. Okay, got to talk to you afterwards. He's making moves. So, But listen, we love children here at New Hope. And uh, we want to just thank you because you make it possible for us to provide these wonderful environments for our, our children and our teens, our middle and high schoolers. Listen, if you have, an, if you have children or a teen and you want to see... Uh, what, what has been done either before service or after service to go into those classrooms. I mean, they've made all kinds of, they've put all beautiful murals there, biblical murals for the kids to really get an understanding of, of the gospel and the, and the truths of God on, on, on just the, on the walls. It's fantastic. Uh, go to our, one of the, those uh, modulars. I want to thank you guys for uh, just financially giving so that we could have uh, space for our teens and our youth. I just can't thank you guys enough for that. 
And uh, our goal, by the grace of God, is that these children and our teens will grow into not only a saving knowledge of Jesus, but that they would lean on him all the days of their life. Amen? So symbolically, I'm just going to ask you to extend your hands forward. Kind of. Jesus loved to bless the little children. He had to rebuke the disciples who kind of hindered them. And so we kind of do this in honor of that. And we just want to pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for these children. Thank you for our teens. Thank you, as your word says, that children are a gift from the Lord. And Father, we know, Lord, that they have a tendency to run around and make marriage proposals when they're up front. And <laughs> Father, we know that uh, sometimes it gets uh, uh, a little messy, but Father, you can handle mess. And uh, we want to love people, and we want them to have a wonderful experience in God that's going to be life-transforming. And I thank you for all our gospel-transformed servant leaders that prepared lessons uh, for our children and our, and our youth. May you continue, Lord, to use them and bless them in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Woo-hoo. Thank you, thank you. Did everybody get a weekend program? If you didn't get a weekend program, please just raise your hand. We, one of our rushes would love to get you one. There's a ton of things that are going on here at New Hope. I'm not going to go over everything in this uh, weekend program. I'm just going to mention just uh, quickly a few. And tonight, tonight we're having a, our commissioning celebration service because God is doing something new. He's birthing something new, and that's a wonderful thing. And, uh, you know, when we think, when we think in the Bible uh, of, you know, like some of the, the main biblical heroes in the Bible, we'd, you know, we'd say, well, you know, Abraham, Moses, you know, David, uh, the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, or the Apostle John, and they'd probably be somewhere in our top ten list. But we'd probably, if, if we had other lists, probably the one I'm thinking about tonight wouldn't probably even make our top 100. And that's uh, Ephroditus, and the Apostle Paul mentions him two times. He's two times in all Scripture in the book of Philippians. And in Philippians chapter 2, verse 25, Paul describes him as, here's my fellow worker, my, my, my fellow soldier, my, my messenger, my, my co-worker for Christ. And he identifies him in a way that uh, the, the word there is used as messenger, and, and it kind of has the implication of being commissioned. And so what, what we see is a beautiful picture, uh, probably one of the first times in the Scripture where we see a local body commissioning this person to go and meet, basically, Paul's needs. And uh, without him, we probably would have never had the book of Philippians, and we really wouldn't have a real good uh, understanding of being sent and being commissioned. And let me just kind of give a little thing about what I mean by being commissioned. At New Hope, we believe commissioning is kind of like two things, really. One, we believe in a lifestyle of commissioning. In other words, that for every born-again believer who's been regenerated by the Spirit of God, that we have been commissioned and sent out by Jesus to be ambassadors for Christ, to be ministers of reconciliation, that every soon, we ha that calling has been already empowered, where we live, work, and play, and using our gifts and talents and, and our treasures that God's given us to be able to bring Him glory and receive our great joy in service to Him. And secondly, we also see that there are seasons where you want to commission people, whether for short-term or long-term service for God. And that's what we're talking about tonight. And um, it's going to be, I think, one of the great things that a real encouragement, not only in our locality, but also uh, as we're going to see later on. And I usually give three, what I give three focuses, basically, to, to Mike and Katie and to those who are on his team and are going to be going with him. Three things I would encourage you to focus on. One, that you would focus that your primary call is not to ministry, but to intimacy with Christ. Because that is where you're going to discover the power that you need to do the miraculous, or else the tendency is to do that in your own strength. And the second focus, I think, is critical, is that is your primary purpose. And I'm going to 
kind of say that it's just not about starting a new work or starting a new congregation. But it's actually engaging a city to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That you and your team are going to be about making disciples while Jesus builds his church. And third, focus I would encourage is to understand that as God, God starts his congregation, God's doing it. He's doing the work. You and I really need to realize that that is bigger than us. It's actually bigger than our city as well. It is about God's redemptive work in the world as he is reaching every people, tongue, tribe, and nation into a right relation with God. That we're part of a greater story. And uh, that is an amazing thing. And I, I, I want to invite you to participate in that. And so as I know some, as they, we see Mike and a lot of the people that we're accustomed to are going to be going, we, we kind of get... Oh, you know, I won't have anybody to go to lunch with or something, you know. <laughs> I feel the loss and the grief. And uh, I, would, I would encourage us really to, to realize that we, we believe in a lifestyle of commissioning. You guys are commissioned not because I do it or our district superintendent or anything like that. God's already done that for every born-again believer regenerated by the Spirit. Jesus says, the Father sent me, I am sending you. He's already given it. And so uh, one of the ways I'm going to encourage us as we see, we're going to need, by the grace of God, as we're seeing God do some amazing things. Now, if you wouldn't mind taking this weekend program real quick, I'm just going to mention something. I don't know if you noticed, when you came in, you saw this huge tractor trailer just blocking the, the, uh, the uh, parking lot. I'm like, man, that's rude. You know, we're having a service here. Why is this thing here? Well, listen, there is a white sheet. This white sheet, and it says, Houston, we have your back. And so we're, next Saturday, next Saturday, we're looking to fill that truck. And so we're in partnership now uh, with, uh, it's Landstar Transportation. They have donated the fuel to go there and back. Uh, uh, Arquilio. Ruiz, who is an owner-operator of that truck, he owns that truck, has donated the use of his truck and his time to drive it down to Houston. Uh, we're in partnership with Second Baptist Church down in Texas, who is going to be distributing all the stuff. Our part here, as we're looking to partner with the local churches in town and businesses and clubs and associations over the next five or six days, is to fill that truck. And then we're going to have two drop-off days. Uh, for you to do that, and there's a list on this sheet, and I'm going to encourage you to pray about what you believe God would tell you to bring, whether it's a case of water, or whether it's toothpaste, whatever the, this list is, and uh, we're going to see a community come together, and uh, we are, uh, as well as our president has asked this weekend that we, as a nation, would take a moment and pray for Houston, which is amazing, okay, you have our president calling a national day of prayer, uh, and uh, we're going to honor that uh, not only as we pray for you, sin, but uh, with a heart transformed because of what Jesus did, we're going to see that come to life in our generosity. Amen? Amen. Amen. So uh, let's, uh, let's take a moment. We're going to pray for Houston, okay? Father, there comes a time in a generation where, Lord, tragedy occurs, there is pain, there is sorrow, there is sickness. These are the things that, Lord, we are born into the world, Lord. It's already there. Uh, we didn't bring it with us, Lord, but, Father, sometimes, Lord, we have a part to play. And, Father, we can choose to be part of the problem or we can choose to be part of a solution. And, Father, because of Jesus, Lord, you have burdened our hearts. You've aligned our heart with the Father's heart in such a way that we desire to be part of your solution, to bring healing and hope to people's lives, that they would come to a place of despair and instead come to a place of hope in you. And so, Father, I pray that you would stir up, Father, just a, a, a spirit of generosity in us in such a way that we would love people we have never met, we would have a heart for a community and a city that many of us have never went to. 
But Father, simply because, Lord, we see a need and you burden our hearts thousands of miles away, Lord, we are willing, Lord, to generously, Father, be commissioned in this thing. And so, Father, I pray that you would just get the word out there and, Father, uh, allow us, by the grace of God, it's an impossible task. I, that, that truck was a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be. And, uh, Father, it, unless you come, we'll never do it. And so it's a God-sized task, but you're up to it, and we're believing you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, listen, we're in for an awesome treat tonight, and um, our district superintendent, uh, Reverend Chuck Hughes, is here tonight for part of our uh, commissioning celebration. He'll be here tonight, uh, tomorrow morning as well, uh, and um, he, I believe, has a, always has a word from the Lord. Uh, I know he has a word for us, and specifically, uh, I believe it's going to have a great impact uh, on our West, Camp our West Venice campus as we're seeing uh, that to be launched off next week. And they're going to have their first service in uh, Venice Christian School. It's going to be amazing, and uh, that's just, just an awesome thing. And so I'm going to invite Chuck to come up. I think he's probably going to need one of these little puppies here. I tend to be ad lib. Thank you very much. You know me, I need to stand behind something and put notes on something, but Amen. hey, thank you, brother. Thank you, Pastor Eddie. Thank you. Well, it's great to be with you to celebrate uh, and to commission, and um, I have my wife's permission to tell you this story, um, so I mean, really, I do, otherwise I would be in trouble, I wouldn't share it with you, except after the service, if you were to say, do you have any funny stories to tell? And uh, anyway, so um, there we go. Thanks, Ramon. Otherwise, we'd be, I'd be like this, and maybe you'd think I'd have more of the spirit if I did that, you know, if I was always moving, but, you know. So anyway, uh, we were walking out of the hotel tonight to get ready to come to the service, and it started to rain. I said, let me go get my, the car, and I'll pick you up under the overhang so you don't get wet. So I go out, get in my car, start driving toward the overhang, and I see my wife getting, starting to open the door of another white car that looks like my white car. And I'm, you know, you had that one moment where you want to say, no, don't, that's the wrong car. Don't do this. Uh, and, uh, but she, she recovered so well, she opened the door as I was pulling up and uh, there was a lady sitting there. Fortunately, there was a lady sitting in the passenger side and so the, the guy didn't, you know, didn't know what was going on, I'm sure. And, and the lady was sitting there, and my wife right away made this statement. By the way, we're providing valet service here at the hotel, and, and uh, let me help you. Would, you. would you like help with your door and everything like that? Which I thought was an excellent recovery, by the way. <laughs> but, and, and I drove up, and I picked her up. She got in the right car, and we made it to church, and she came with me, and that's good. Amen. But it reminded me of something. I thought... How do you know you're in the right car? Let me translate it. How do you know you're in the right church? Is it possible that someone might have come to church tonight and heard about sending people away from this church to start another church when this church isn't filled? Why would you do that? Is it possible they said, I don't understand this church that talks about bringing a truck outside and you're going to load it up with things, and we're going to give of our stuff to take it to a whole other city far away from us, that, by the way, there's another hurricane coming. And it's coming toward Florida. Let's keep praying that it goes someplace, you know, out in the ocean. Not to anybody else, but out in the ocean, okay? Yeah, don't, please, we, as Christians, we can't play. Just don't let it hit us. It's okay if it goes someplace, you know, anyway. When you come to a place, when you, you read the, 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 the flyer of the ministries and realize there's so much opportunity and so many things that this church is giving away, when you realize that you already have an East Campus and a Spanish Campus, and we think of Pastor Ted and Pastor Ramon here, and then launching another one, you say, well, maybe I'm in the wrong church because I want to go to a church that they don't take risks. I want to go to a church where everybody's comfortable and they make me feel good about being me. And they don't ask very much of me. They don't ask me to serve. They don't ask me to sacrifice. They don't ask me to pray. Well, if that's the case, you just open the door and you're in the wrong church. Because this is a church, 
And as long as I know Pastor Eddie since, by the way, in 2004, wasn't it? Was it four? 2003. I lost a year in there. You know, it comes with the age. In 2003, I remember when this church was launched. You know when it was launched? Hurricane Charlie. They had a choice, and with the Alliance Church in Port Charlotte, who is their mother church, saying, well, should you, we just stay together, and, and you know, with this hurricane, our building's destroyed and everything like that, about launching this church, and they said, no, we're going forward, we're taking the risk, we're launching, and by the way, the mother church can come meet with us while their building is being repaired, at least for the first couple of months, and then they found another place to meet. So you think about that. Think about being launched out of a hurricane, and now you're filling up a truck to take supplies to a place where people are hurting because of a hurricane. God has called us to have courage. God has called us to be a courageous people and a courageous church. And by the way, this is the right church for you tonight. Amen. Amen. And I have been blessed to observe the years and the history of this church and what God has done in this place. Not just this place and this people. You've had different places. It's not about the building, it's about the people. That's the church. And so as you are, and as we are commissioning and celebrating tonight the launch of a new campus, we have to understand what it takes to have that kind of courage to do that. Because, by the way, that is something all of us face. We all face issues and things that we might have been afraid of or things that cause us to hesitate a bit, to stand back and, and maybe not make the commitment, the decision, the sacrifice to step out. Maybe it's a conversation with someone about our faith in Jesus, or maybe it's the opportunity to serve. Whatever it might be, God has called us to be a courageous people. But oftentimes we carry the baggage of fear. And you know, we live in a society where people like being afraid. It seems like horror movies are the more popular movies because people like to be afraid. And I think it's because they like artificial fear because it makes them forget their real fears. Maybe you felt this way. The fear of rejection. What if people don't accept me? What if, what, and so we become people pleasers or something like that because we have a fear of rejection or we just don't enter into healthy relationships, and we come to a church where the message is about acceptance, not judgment, so that our fears can be confronted. Maybe it's a fear of failure. What if, what if something fails? What if it doesn't work? And so many people stand back, they conserve their meager resources out of fear, maybe in your own life, in your own family, in your own work. You're not taking the faith-filled risk to step out and follow God's voice. Maybe it's the fear of abandonment. We become controlling people when that's the fear that motivates us. Whatever the fear may be, if we operate out of fear, then we'll never move forward in what God wants us to do. Acts chapter 4, to me, is one of the most exciting chapters in Scripture. I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles there. And we're just going to look at a few verses here, but talk about this chapter. Because it confronts this issue of this. Some people are in the paralysis of analysis. They never make a decision. They never move out in their personal lives. They said well, they can't because they're analyzing it because they're afraid to get it wrong. Friends, if you don't take the risk of getting it wrong, you'll never get it right. You'll never experience the power of God. So as we think of courageous living, we have to understand if we are controlled by fear, we will never live with courage. If we are ever to increase our gospel footprint, what we talk in our district about what you're doing planting this new campus, then we will never, we'll never increase our gospel footprint, but we need courage to do that, to overcome fear. The next slide shows us those, those words and a statement that Rob Reimer makes. I think it's a powerful statement. And here's something you need to understand. And it's that second quote. You see here, you see you can either act on fear or act on faith, but you cannot act on both. In our fear, we often sin. We fail to follow God. You know, 
we think about the potential of the church in America today. The, uh, the reality that probably at least 17.7% of the people in, in, in the United States today do not, are, are uh, only that number are attending a, a church, much less a gospel-centered, Bible-believing, Holy Spirit-moving church. And so there's over 80% of the people, in, in, at least in our state here, that we have to understand do not have, aren't a part of a gospel-centered church. And sometimes what the reason is, is we haven't brought that gospel-centered church to them for them to see. That's why you start another campus. You go to where they are, you go to start a ministry near them, you make it accessible to them so that the light of the gospel might continue. But fear for many churches holds them back. They, it, fear of all kinds of things, loss of people, loss of resources. You know what I found is you cannot give God. God always blesses. When you have courage, God blesses. When you multiply, when you sacrifice, when you give, when you take the risk, God takes it and makes more of it. Read Scripture and tell me you don't see that in God's Word. And so we have to think it that way. So here we come to Acts chapter 4. You understand the context. The disciples now becoming apostles. Chapter 1, they are given the great, the great commission again. You will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will receive power and be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. Chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes, Pentecost happens, Holy Spirit comes, the church is initiated, 3,000 people come to faith in Christ that day. Well, exciting beginning. Chapter 3, there's an amazing healing that takes place. A man who had been lame from birth, immobilized from birth. What did Peter say to them? Silver and gold have I none, but what I offer to you, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. And he was healed. He's walking around, people are praising God, and suddenly the religious leaders say, they're talking about Jesus. We just, was, didn't we just kill him? And now they're still talking about Jesus. And here's what it says in chapter 4, verse 13, which I think is a powerful verse. Look with me. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. That has to be the reason why they had courage. That has to be it. They had been with Jesus. Isn't it great that that would be what you're known for? That Jesus had rubbed off on them enough that they would say, oh, they've been around Jesus. They talk like he does. They, they act like he does. They have the courage of Jesus. But wait a minute. Time out. They had been with Jesus for three years. They had been, they'd seen miracles. They'd seen Jesus raise the dead. They had Jesus seen... The, Feed the 5,000, 15,000 actually, when you count everybody that was there. They had seen Jesus deliver people from demons. They'd seen him walk on water. They'd seen him calm the waves and the sea. They had been with him for three years and seen everything that could be displayed about the power of God. And still, when Jesus was arrested and when he was crucified, they ran away in fear and in hiding. And Peter, their leader, even denied Jesus three times. So, they had been with Jesus. Did that really make a difference? And I want you to think about this for a moment, because here's the, here's the reality is, they actually, the leaders who made that statement, actually gave the right answer. They had been with Jesus, but they didn't know what they were saying. These religious leaders had no clue about what they were saying. They didn't know the whole story. Because what transformed them and what made them different was not just having been around Jesus for three years. What had happened was they had encountered the resurrected, risen Lord of glory, Jesus Christ. And that made the difference. That gave them courage when the Holy Spirit came upon them as a result of meeting the risen Christ, victorious Christ. A close relationship 
with the living Christ fuels courage. And we need to understand that. It fuels courage. His presence overcomes our fears and gives us the courage to live for His glory. And that's why we do what we do. That's why this church exists. That's why campuses are planted and started. Because the courage that we serve and we have a relationship with the risen Christ. Now, what does that mean for us? What does it mean for these these leaders that we see such transformation, such a difference in their lives? Well, first of all, they had been with the resurrected Jesus. What does that mean? Well, you have to understand what's involved with that. And I think that may be on the next slide, so you can just kind of follow along there. But what's the whole issue here is they had been with the resurrected Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Christ is our victor. He's victorious. He faced sin, he faced death, he faced Satan, and he won. God wins. God wins. The tomb could not hold him. You know what? There's a lot of famous tombs. There's a lot of famous tombs all over the world today. You can go to these tombs and there's that tomb. Why is that tomb famous? Well, there's this dead guy in there. And he did something really remarkable, and his bones are there. Some tombs you even go. I was with my wife, and we were, we were traveling uh, on, a, on a vision tour, mission trip, and we were in Moscow. We walked through where Lenin's tomb was. There Lenin is, under glass. Lenin under glass. My wife had been there in 1972, when it was still the Soviet Union. She says, yeah, he looks the same. He hasn't changed. <laughs> Well, that's what happens when you're dead. Well, sometimes you change unless you're under glass, I guess. But my point, and they preserve you, but my point is, why is that famous? We had to walk through quietly. You couldn't take pictures. You couldn't say a word. So there's this stream of quietness, of reverence, as we walk through this place that had Lenin's tomb there in in the, the Kremlin, there in Red Square. And there's, there's thousands of tombs in different countries, famous because there are dead guys in them who were famous and leaders and all kinds of things, monuments. But there is one tomb. There is one tomb that is famous today. Not because there's a dead guy in there. It's because that guy rose from the dead. And he is victorious. He is the victor. The sacrifice for our sins has been accepted. How do you know you're forgiven? Because the Father accepted the sacrifice of the Son, and now we're forgiven. That's the seal. That's the sign. He conquered death. We have no fear of death because life is eternal for those who follow Christ. But we also understand something else. If He is the victor, He also has authority. I love the the Great Commission. What does the Great Commission say? That's another reason why you're planning another campus, to go out and reach people, spread the gospel. But what does it say in the Great Commission? Go and make disciples, right? But before it says that, what does it say? All authority has been given. Just as Jesus talking now, you understand that. All authority has been given under heaven and earth unto me. In other words, Jesus by his victory, had received and and had the authority, all authority, and then he says, go. So, Mike, as you think about, you started this campus, Eddie, you guys, as you think about sending out, you have to understand that, what what do you go, whose authority do you go in? I go in the authority of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Well, that's okay. Don't get me wrong, I, I'm a part of that, and I like that, you know? I believe in it. I go in the authority of New Hope Church, Community Church. That's good. You need to go out. You don't want to go out in rebellion. That's called a split. That's not a plant, okay? <laughs> no, you go out in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. You go out in His name. You set up your worship and the place you're going to be meeting, you, you stand and preach, you stand and sing, and we do it here too, in the authority, under the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. When you know that, by the way, when churches are planted, my first ministry was a church plant. The enemy hates church planting. The enemy hates starting new campuses. He hates it when churches multiply. He just hates it. And so he throws junk at it. 
And he tries to trip it up and mess it up in the beginning. You know this. Alfredo knows this, our director of church planning. You know how this is. And the enemy, just he wants to mess it up in the beginning. And that's why we stand in prayer. That's why we stand and in, 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 in join hands together and support one another. But we stand in the authority of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And with the armor of God, we have victory. It means we're obedient to Him. We're under His authority. So we're saying, Lord, what do you want us to do? Okay, we'll do it. It's not saying, God, I have a plan, and it's a great plan. Would you bless my plan? No, it's God, what's your plan? I want to join you in your plan. So we pray, we listen, because we serve the risen, authoritative Christ. That means when we understand that He is the resurrected Jesus, we encounter Him in relationship, that He is also our safety. You see, the fact is, is there's nothing that man can do to you. You belong to Jesus. My destiny is secure. No one can rob me of my eternal place in, in the kingdom of God with Jesus. No suffering, no persecution, none of that. I am safe in His arms. And He has accepted us. Christ is our acceptance. There is no fear of rejection. What does Scripture remind us? Greater is He that is in us than He that is in the world. Who can bring a charge against God's people, God's elect? No one can. Because we belong to Jesus. So when we spend time with Him in silence and solitude, when we reflect what Pastor Eddie said about the intimacy of God, the only way you're going to know the risen Christ is if you have an intimate relationship with Him. Otherwise, he's a distant, victorious Lord, not an intimate Savior, friend, and Lord who you experience his presence within yourself, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's why all of these truths are great, but if you don't do anything with it, if you don't think about it, if you don't meditate on it, if you don't read it in the Word, if you don't pray about it, if you don't journal sometime about it, write some of the things he's telling you, if you're not listening to his voice, then to say He is risen is wonderful, but you're not going to experience the power of His resurrection. My granddaughter, Emily, when she was just a few months old, maybe eight or nine months old, whenever she would see me, because I'd be traveling a lot, I would come, she'd look at me, and she'd start to cry. And she loved Dale, she, her grandmother, yeah, I like Grand Dale, but Granddaddy, yeah, I'm not so sure about that guy, who's that guy, you know? I asked my grandson, who was four years old, why is she afraid of me? And he says, well, because you look like a ghost. I said, what do you mean? Well, you're all white. Your beard, your, your face, you're all white. I go, thanks, thanks, grandson. <coughs> but that has begun to change. In fact, that's changed pretty quickly. And so now when I see my two-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter, she sees me and she says, hello, granddaddy. <laughs> you know, and I just go, oh, okay. Why? Because familiarity does not breed contempt. It deepens faith. Familiarity deepens a relationship. It deepens so we understand His voice. We know what He's saying. We have an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. He is not a distant deity. He is an intimate Father. And that way you know the power of the resurrection. Two more points real quickly. Not only is he the one who is, we encounter the resurrected Jesus, but we encounter the same Jesus who restores us and heals us. You see, Jesus forgave them. He came into the upper room. He said, peace be with you. And back in John chapter 20, he had forgiven, in 19 and 20, and he had forgiven them. He had said, you know, you're forgiven. I died for your sins. Even Peter, I died to pay for your denial." Your failure. Do you realize every time they encountered him after the resurrection in those days before he ascended to heaven, when they encountered him, they encountered the risen Christ. That's, pretty, that's great. But every time they saw him, they saw something else. Every time they saw this victorious Jesus, they also saw what? Nail prints in his hands, his feet and knew there was a spear mark in his side. Why? 
Because every time you encounter the risen Christ, you, under, uh, you encounter the one that forgave you, paid the penalty for your sin, but has the power to restore you to relationship with himself. That's why it's interesting for us to look in John chapter 21. If you were to turn over to John chapter 21, but I'll just st state the verse to you real quickly for sake of time. We find in 1 John it says, perfect love casts out fear, right? Perfect love casts out fear. And when you know you're loved by God, you will not be afraid. When you really spend time dwelling in his love and his acceptance... But what do we need to understand? That he, we need to allow him to enter our past failures our, and, and really bring that forgiveness and that healing and that restoration. You, you, I find it interesting that Peter, when Jesus came to him and he said three times, do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Peter? And, and Peter said, of course I do. And I think Peter was getting a little frustrated. He was like, what's going on? And he said, well, you feed my sheep, feed my lambs. You know, that, those, that commissioning, right? Why three times? We all know why, right? What was he doing? What was Jesus doing? Was, was, was Peter forgiven already? How many of you think he was already forgiven? He was forgiven on the cross. What was he doing right there for Peter? He was healing him. He was bringing him back. Three times. Commitment. Three times he had failed, and yet Jesus was saying, come back, be healed, be restored, allow the wounds to be taken away. Whatever you're facing in your life right now, whatever your struggles are, whatever your past wounds are, your past fears, your past failures, Jesus does not only want to forgive you, he wants to restore you. He wants to heal you. He wants to empower you. All of us have baggage, right? All of us have things we carry with us. I bet on this team going out to Venice that every one of them is perfect and has never had a problem in their whole lives, right? <laughs> oh God. And you're sending out only the ones that are, are just never, you know, oh, everything was good. I know better. We all have stories. We all have stories to tell of our failures. But friends, Jesus wants to enter into each one of those so that he can make us not only healed, but restored and ready to serve. The third point in this is this. They were with the Jesus who remains with us. He never, never leaves us or forsakes us. Verse 8 of chapter 4, if we really go back, we can begin to understand what's going on here. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. Don't overlook that. Now, at Pentecost in chapter 2, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Then here in chapter 4, it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. If you read at the end of chapter 4, what you discover again is that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a reminder to us that just because you were filled once doesn't mean that you don't need to keep on being filled. You need to keep constant in this relationship. Jesus remains with us through the Holy Spirit. And we need to understand that. I mean, they were standing there before the Sanhedrin in, in, in a similar configuration that Jesus had. The same guys who said, crucify Jesus. The same ones that had a trial for Jesus. The same ones that wanted him dead and helped, the Rome, helped get the Romans to help kill Jesus. And now these guys, they're standing before the same ones that had killed Jesus, and yet they stood with courage. I think it's because they knew something these guys didn't know. Not only had they been with Jesus, remember the verse says that? I, we think they've been with Jesus. I would love Peter and John to say, hey, by the way, he's still here. He's still here, living in us through the Holy Spirit, empowered by his presence. Because Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. I love the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Everybody know the story? We don't have time to go back and read it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what did they do? They, they would not bow down to the idol, that Nebuchadnezzar, the image Nebuchadnezzar had, right, back in Daniel chapter 3. And what did they do? For those who, were, who did that, if you weren't willing to bow down, we've got to throw you into the fire. 
fire was so hot that the people that were throwing them in died because it was so hot? And guess what happens? The three of them are in there, and what happens? They don't get burnt. They're walking around in there. There's these three guys walking around in there, right? Three guys walking around in there. Wait a minute. Pause. There were four guys walking around in there. Who do you think the fourth guy was? Jesus, second person of the Trinity, manifesting himself in his presence. They were not alone. Friends, when you walk through the fire, and you will walk through fires, when you are persecuted, when you are resisted, when people, when people put you down, when you face hardship and difficulty and things like that, know that you're not alone. When you walk through the fire, he is with you. As you launch out, that's, what, you know, that's why sometimes people don't take risks. Well, will Jesus be with me? What did Jesus tell his disciples at the end of the Great Commission in Matthew? Lo, I am with you always. And we understand that's, that's the language of the time. It didn't mean that only when you're low, not, you know. Come on, help. What it's saying is this. I am with you always. When I say, tell you to go, I'll be with you. When I tell you to make disciples, I'll be with you. When you baptize, I'll be with you. When you teach, I'll be with you. When you disciple, I will be with you. When you face persecution, I will be with you. When you stand in front of the Sanhedrin, I will be with you. When you go out and you gather in a room and start a new church and you're going, oh boy, what's this going to be like? He is saying, I will be with you. Amen. And those of you who are still here, back here saying, where did all my friends go? He will be with you too. And the East Campus, and the Spanish Campus, and the Next Campus, and all the churches that are following Christ and people following Christ, he is, I am with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. But we have to cultivate this. It's very interesting when they release them and let them go, because they couldn't do anything to them, because here's this guy who had been lame from birth, and now he's walking around, you know, as evidence. They go back, and you know what the first thing they do? They have a prayer meeting. Why? Because when you think about the awareness of God's presence, you have to cultivate it. You have to remain in Him. He remains in you, with you, in you, but you have to remain in Him. You have to abide in Him. And you have to ask with boldness. You have to come. They came with boldness. They didn't come and say, Oh, Lord, get us out of this mess. Oh, Lord, protect us from the, from the religious leaders. Make us safe, Jesus. This is scary. What did they say? Give us boldness that we may declare the gospel with even more greater boldness and more greater courage. Because when you go into the presence of God with courage and boldness, which he says for us to come in Hebrews chapter 14 and, and chapter 10, enter into his presence with confidence, you better go out with confidence or something happened in there that wasn't quite right. You need to get it right. In, if you bold in, bold out, right? That's why we pray. That's why we seek the Lord. That's why we come into his presence because when we come into his presence, we're in the presence of of the Almighty God, and He gives us a boldness and a courage. So, friends, as we stand here tonight, this evening and tomorrow, and we commission a team that is being sent out from this church, we have to understand that if we are playing it safe, we'll never see the amazing work of God and the miracles God wants to do if we just play it safe. Amen. But we, if we act with courage, if we act with the confidence in Him, then we can know His presence. The church has been this way for... Where the, when the church has been on the move, this is the kind of church that God wants. This is the kind of church that changes the world. I, I, I love this old story, and it's a story about Christians back in the early, in like the second and third century. And maybe you've heard the story before, it's the, the, that uh, people were, the plague had come to the Roman Empire. 
And if you know the story, you know that the Christians were dying in the plague just like everybody else because we know that happens. Hurricanes happen to Christians and non-Christians. If you went to Houston today, you would find that there are Christians with their houses underwater just like non-Christians, right? The rain falls on, you know, that happens. It's what you do with it, right? Think about this for a moment. So anyway, the plague came and many people were getting killed. Many people were dying. But Christians did something different than the world around them. They died from the plague like everybody else. But unlike everybody else, they cared for the victims of the plague, including their pagan neighbors. This wasn't new. They had done this before in a previous plague. Christians stayed in the afflicted cities when pagan leaders, including even pagan physicians, fled in fear. How could they do that? Their own family and relatives were dying, but they were taking in the others who were dying. How could they do that? Because they had encountered the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ and they knew that their destiny was heaven and there was nothing this world could do to them. Because they knew that He would restore and heal as according to His will and purposes and they knew that He was with them. And therefore, they did not leave the city they went to the city. They stayed in the city. Your pastor talked about the fact that it's not about planting a church, it's about reaching a city. Christians have always, who follow Jesus, cared about the city. You are caring for the city of Venice and Northport and beyond. Amen. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, may what we do today and this evening be a commitment to the work of God. Lord, we, we're, we're not praying to get riled up and rah-rah and all that kind of thing. This is not about that. This is about wanting to experience your presence. But then, Lord, to act in courage with your courage, not in fear. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for its leadership. I thank you for... Pastor Eddie and Norma and all the leaders and, and all the campuses and their leaders and their pastors. and We're just so thankful. And Lord, we're going to commission in a moment. So Lord, I just would just seal all of us. Because Lord, here's the, here's the thing we stand before you. Every person in this room will be tempted to fear. Every person in this room, young and old, have to deal with old wounds. And Lord, I just pray that you bring your presence to bring healing. That old wounds can close and new steps can be taken to walk in your presence. Fill these people with the Holy Spirit afresh and anew. It's not enough that it happened only once. It has to happen again and again and again, the continuous filling of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, do this for this church, these people. Lord, bless them and multiply them because of the risks they're taking. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. That's to come up. I'd like for all for uh, West Campus who's going to come with this team. Come on up. We'd love to take a moment here. Don't get nervous. Come on. Woohoo! Let's give him a shout. I'm going to ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got more shirts. You got more shirts, yeah. And uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask all our pastors in the room uh, to come on up. And uh, we're, we're just going to ask God's blessing on them. And we're going to believe God for just a, an amazing outcome. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. You know, there is an, I think, uh, 
something that sets our heart uh, really excited, for me anyway, uh, and the joy that God's given me uh, to be your pastor is to see how the Spirit of God grows in you and moves and how uh, people's lives are touched. And uh, some might know, some might not know, Mike's a retired Northport police sergeant, and uh, he's served this city for decades, 24 years in service. He retired early because he felt the call of God on his life. All right? Now, he's not going to tell you that. I'll tell you that. In other words, that when, he, when, he di- when he discovered God, when you saw God in his life, his life and all that he's done has been to love God and love people. And uh, it's not something that he's tried to attain. It's just something that is born in him through the Spirit of God. If you get to know Katie, Katie is an absolute beast <laughs> in an awesome way where her creativity, her heart to serve, uh, I, I mean... She served over at the, at the East Campus for a long time and uh, lugging chairs and tables. And, I mean, you, amazing, just amazing, amazing, amazing. She's like, are you sure? Like, no, you're it. And, uh, and just a heart to serve. And I want, you, I want you to just realize, I could probably go to each person here and, and each one who has a heart to serve. You know what? They made themselves available. And even though... We're all flawed and unqualified. God qualifies the call. And, and, even though, and even though none of us have all the greatest gifts and all the greatest wonders, we all have the one thing that's needed most. As Chuck said, the presence of God, the risen Savior. And each one here has a story. Each one has a life transformed. Each, each one has had impact in people's lives. And we as the body of Christ want to affirm that. We want to affirm that. We want to say that we affirm what the Spirit is doing. We want to affirm what God has birthed in people. And we're believing God for a huge impact. Not only in Venice, because I believe that as we send, God's stirring us here as well. It's always a reminder of the mission God's called us here in our own city. It's always a reminder of the fact that the work isn't done. And uh, until the Lord comes back or he takes us home, the the work is not done. Amen? So I'm going to ask Alfredo. My boss, my second boss, my first boss, the second boss, boss, the the good-looking boss. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, he's going to lead us in blessing all of us. Amen, amen. Uh, You guys can still back out. (laughs) You can still back out. (laughs) (laughs) One last shot. (laughs) You're in? Anybody else want to join us? (laughs) (laughs) Amen, amen. Uh, Well, uh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, I thought of two things as uh, Chuck was preaching and then Pastor was talking. Grew up in the streets of Miami. Whenever you wanted to scare a bigger person than you, you slap him in the mouth first. You <laughs> slap me? But at least you got the first shot, right? And if you can get blood out, it was even better. Because like, okay. Uh, the idea was hopefully, hopefully we can scare them all. Right? <laughs> the other picture I thought it was Rocky. <laughs> He's getting the tar beat out of him. I don't know if you remember. Last round, he gets up and he goes like this. And he goes like this. And Apollo Creed goes, man. <laughs> and uh, the enemy will smack you in the mouth. If he can draw blood, trying to scare you. He's been defeated. That's it. 
He'll scare you, but that's it. It's like the lion that growls. Ah, you no. Know? You don't pay attention to that. Make the enemy go, man. <laughs> and keep going. Amen. Let me pray for you all. Father, I thank you for this team. Uh, it is a team uh, of the redeemed. Each one of them could testify, where would I be without the grace of Jesus? Lord, let them point not to strategies. Let them point not to all that they know and have learned, even to their own resiliency. Let others see Jesus in them. As they see them, they could say, if God did it for them, he could do it for me. Lord, I thank you because this is a sanctified group, a set-apart team. Father, speak to them tonight and tell them, get out if you're trying to do this on your own. You can't do it. So I pray for a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. May they be filled, filled, so that they may know the joy of the Lord, so that they may walk in the anointing and unction and power of the Holy Spirit. May every crown, may every star, may every gift that you have given them, that they put it at the feet of Christ. He is the one. He is the champion. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. So I pray, Lord, that you will separate them for yourself. Or give us Venice. Give us Venice, Lord. So I pray for favor. I pray for protection. I pray for unity. I pray, I pray for good communication. I pray for health. I pray, Lord, that even in the days ahead as they struggle, that they will see Christ. Give them trust in each other as a team. Give them compassion for one another. Give them hope that you are building your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. May Venice see this congregation, this community of believers as a blessing. As a blessing, Lord. So we pray for your anointing upon Mike and Katie, but the team, Lord. Unite them, Lord, that they may present Jesus Christ to every man, woman, and child, and that they will give them multiple opportunities so that they may see, hear, and respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for Mama Church that you will supply all that they are losing right now. Take the fear away of Mama Church. You will send the people that will come, that will tithe. Lord, and I pray by faith for that new fishing that we put out there for new planters. Lord, and by extension, we pray for Ramon, that you will bless that brother. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So I ask you to fill them with the knowledge of your will according to all the wisdom. And understand that the Spirit gives. That they may live a life worthy of you and please you in every way. Bearing fruit in every good work. Growing in the knowledge of God. And strengthen them with all power according to your glorious might. So that they may have great endurance and patience. With joyful thanks, Lord, we thank you, Father, for you have qualified them to share in the inheritance of your holy people. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome.
Awesome, awesome. Love you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate you. Let me just uh, thank everyone for coming out. And uh, uh, as uh, I'm just going to close in prayer. And uh, I want to just uh, take a moment. And uh, I want to uh, thank and acknowledge uh, one of our Northport City Commissioners who came out, Jill Luke. And uh, I was very, very kind. Thank you very much. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we are humbled that you would, Father, use flawed and broken people like us, and you would call us by name, that you have fearfully and wonderfully made us, that you rejoice over us with singing, that you have prepared a work for us to do that by your grace you have made each one of us your masterpiece. And I pray that we would discover that in deeper and more profound ways as we draw nearer to you, as we learn of your character and your beauty. Father, may we walk and realize, Lord, that you have called every single man, woman, and child with a purpose and a destiny. And I pray, Father, that we continue to walk in it and discover it, Lord, and as you use us, Father, to be history makers and world changers for your glory and our joy. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have an awesome, awesome, awesome evening. Thank you so much.